Thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name is Dick Larson, and I'm from MIT, and my nickname is Dr. Q. Q-U-E-U-E, -U -E -E, as in waiting lines. And Q-E-N, spelled the British way, with the uh, E stay, it stays in at the end, and the I-N-G, if you play Scrabble, it's great, because you get five vowels in a row, that, that's really valuable. But every Q is a business opportunity, and every Q poses problems. So we're going to think about it. Do you know that up to uh, many millions of Americans spend up to two to three years of their waking lives in queues of various kinds? They do. And I can explain that if you uh, want to talk to me about this. So I think of our, our lives as lives on the line. Lives on the line literally and figuratively. And um, also, you could say, well, to queue or not to queue? That should not be the question. That should not be the question. So how do we think about queuing? Well, when was queuing theory born? Well, it was born by an engineer, the Danish telephone engineer, A.K. Erlang, in 1909 to 1915. And he was assigned the job of figuring out what the queue capacity should be of central telephone switches in Copenhagen. And from then, over 10,000 technical mathematical papers have been written about queuing theory. And believe me, I teach some of this stuff at MIT. So I know this. I mean, I've even invented some of it myself. All right, I confess. Then, but there's another aspect to queuing that was born in the mid-1950s. And Walt Disney and Mickey Mouse are, I would give credit to inventing this. They are the Machiavellian experts on the psychology of queuing. They're geniuses. And let me give you a simple example, not a Mickey Mouse example, but uh, in New York City, elevators. After World War II, high-rise buildings, people found themselves living in high-rise apartment buildings, and they found themselves going to high-rise office buildings, and they found rush hours for elevators, just like they found rush hours for buses and cars and subways, all right? So they think, oh my god, there were lots of complaints all of a sudden about rush hour delays for elevators in these buildings. The building owners were getting complaints. How do you think about this? Well, if a traditional engineering approach here, some engineer might go and say, my god, they really need eight elevator shafts at rush hour. There are only four. There's only one solution. Dynamite the building and start over again. We're not going to do that, OK? So uh, a fellow from Wharton School uh, at, in Philadelphia, University of Pennsylvania, went there and said, aha. We've defined the problem incorrectly. It's not the duration of the waits for the elevators. It's the complaints about the duration of the waits. All right? So if you think about that, how do I reduce the complaints? You distract people. You entertain people. All right? So in a moment of great lateral thinking inspiration, this person put in one building, experimental building, floor to ceiling mirrors next to each of the elevators, and then watch what happened. Guess what? The complaints for elevator delay dropped to near zero. Problem solved. Nobody was complaining anymore. Sometimes men and women could even coyly flirt with each other through the reflections. Isn't that interesting? Where they wouldn't do it with eye to eye contact, a little bit too threatening. And the duration of the waits were unchanged. So the psychology of queuing is often just as important as the mathematics of queuing. So that's the thing. Now, I could tell you about loads of queuing problems. There's so many queues, so little time today to talk about these things. Uh, for instance, you will find amazing the actual queue discipline associated when you pick up a telephone waiting for a dial tone. You don't think about it. You're actually, you pick up a t uh, telephone waiting for a dial tone. You don't think that you're in a queue, but you are. And it can be a life and death queue if you're going to call 911. And that's a very bizarre queuing discipline. And uh, I'm prepared to talk to you about it if you want. Now, before uh, we started this evening, many of you gave examples of cues you'd like me to talk about. We have time to select two of these right here. And you can see there are many, over 20 suggestions from the audience this evening. I'm going to pick out two just to indicate what my response might be to your, your suggestions. So number one, pay admission to get into a bank lobby. Aha. One of you lives in Manhattan and is familiar with the Manhattan Savings Bank. Now, the Manhattan Savings Bank had no ATMs. This is history because it's been gobbled up by a larger bank now. It had no ATMs, had 13 branches in Manhattan, and people who were well healed went there and did their transactions with a human, how quaint, a human face-to-face -face teller transaction. All right? Well, they wanted to reduce the angst 
because everyone would go and do their transactions during the lunch hour. And just like the elevator delays, the rush hour, the lines became long. So what's the modern equivalent to the mirrors? The bank managers thought about that, and they said, aha, let us bring in concert pianists. And every day, Monday through Friday, from 11.45 until 1.30, we will have a concert pianist playing piano in our bank lobbies in Manhattan Savings Bank. Guess what? This was so popular that this queue, that actually people wanted to wait in queue longer. And one day, an, uh, uh, an entrepreneur, enterprise and entrepreneur, stood outside and actually sold tickets for cash to get into this lobby. That is number one. Okay. All right. So thank you. Uh, I could see you living in Manhattan for some time. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Uh, I don't want to be looking here. So this is the second. We only have time for one more. Let us see what it is. From the audience. Oh, boy. You must be involved in politics. Multiple lawsuits in Ohio regarding Q delay in the presidential election of 2004. You knew that, huh? Are you a lawyer for one of the sides? Do you know that there are over 20 lawsuits in the state of Ohio claiming that election officials in Ohio deliberately underallocated service facilities like voting booths if throughout the state in order to make the queue so long that some people would get discouraged and leave and not vote and become disenfranchised. Um, there was one case in a, a college students who had to wait till 4 o'clock in the morning to vote. So uh, I've actually participated on, on one side as an advisor to, to one of these lawsuits, the largest one. And uh, so sometimes queuing can come up in, in, in weird ways. It is a fact today that presidential elections and other elections are run by local people who do not, have never been exposed to queuing theory. And so they're, as surprising as it may be, there is no national standard or even local standard for figuring out how many voting booths you should have, how many helpers you should have, all these sorts of things. And so the queuing experiences that we experience exercising our franchise as American citizens are extremely varied from five minutes up until six or seven hours. And uh, that's the kind of cue science we want, to, we want to help. So that's the second one. I don't have time this evening to go through, but I can speak with you personally about the other suggestions you had here. I appreciate your, uh, your attention this evening. And if you want to talk some more, uh, give me a call at MIT. I'd be happy to talk with you.